Good afternoon, everybody. Um, first off, I'd like to apologise for being slightly ill and having a very sore throat. So I'm, uh, I'm a bit gravelly. I'm not, I'm not normally this deep. Um, uh, but hopefully, sure it's not a hangover? <laughs> I'm, 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 it's true. It's completely true it's not a hangover. Um, <clears throat> so um, I'm at the University of Bradford undertaking a PhD. Um, uh, and I can have a bit of a disclaimer to begin with. I'm not um, uh, a trained um, environmental archaeologist. I don't come from the, the beautiful wellspring that you guys do. I am, uh, I am uh, <coughs> prior to starting this PhD, I was a forester that was a manager, so I come from a kind of more experiential side of things, but I'm using a lot of environmental archaeology in the PhD. Um, and this talk follows on really nicely from Terry's. Um, it covers some similar ground. Hopefully it's not too repetitive. Um, uh, um, and I'm going to explore some of the ideas around narrative and how it can be used not just for communication of information, but also perhaps tentatively to um, uh, increase the effectiveness of the scientific method when it comes to investigating woodland. Um, uh, <clears throat> so as part of my research, I use a range of archaeoecological data, pollen diagrams, charcoal studies, tree ring analysis and botanical survey. I'm interested not just in what the past environment was like, but how it was being used and related to. Sometimes these techniques can beautifully illustrate complex interactions of humans with their environment. I um, uh, just picked up an uh, example here that I've been looking at recently. Um, this is um, at Tolksdorf Petal looking at the ecology of medieval mining in eastern Germany. Um, and they very nicely showed the changes in um, uh, uh, forest management through the medieval period um, uh, and how that relates to alterations in the mining economy and the forest management of previous generations. Um, uh, similarly, there are studies coming out, um, uh, especially in continental Europe, um, uh, from charcoal analysis and tree ring analysis, looking at um, past systems of woodland management, such as coppicing, pollarding, etc. Um, uh, but sometimes, and I would say often, the data we get from um, these techniques is noisy or low resolution, um, uh, and um, uh, there are certain kind of um, uh, periods in your record, record that demonstrate neither dramatic change nor a stable system. Um, uh, and of course, this doesn't mean that humans were not interacting with their environment. We always interact with our environment. But the standard approach, the scientific approach, is to say we don't know what's happening here. If the data is meaning poor in a scientific sense, it is skirted around, at worst ignored entirely, at best grudgingly acknowledged. Um, uh, so this is perhaps an example of a pond diagram. Um, uh, and this is some excellent work done by um, Brad Charitel. This, this pond diagram was um, produced by Claire Jones, who's a friend of mine, so she won't mind me using this. Um, uh, and, um, uh, and so that, um, uh, this study was looking at a small um, oak woodland in Devon called Wistman's Wood. Um, uh, which is kind of reputed as um, an ancient woodland that is assumed to have a very long um, ecological history, a long period of stability for an, in order for it to develop the way it has. Um, and this study showed that actually its current formation is, is a more kind of recent phenomenon. Um, uh, and it went through periods of change, um, uh, um, uh, and that has conservation implications. So it's a fantastic paper. But this is kind of like a fairly standard pond diagram, low resolution. So you have large periods in the middle here with the dominant tree species, the oak, not really changing. Um, uh, so we can't really say anything about what's happening there, can we? It's just, um, it's just stable. Um, uh, it's, yeah. um, it is what it is. <coughs> so these are some uh, couple of pictures of coppiced oaks, a new one and old. Um, uh, and I really liked what Louise Isle said, the dynamic interdependence of numerous influences is the biggest challenge faced in understanding changes in the past environment. So the current nub of the problem is that scientific environmental archaeology struggles to tease apart complex, complex situations. It can produce a low resolution snapshot of the surroundings at a particular place in time. It picks up simple dramatic changes and slower vegetational change over longer periods, but it often struggles to provide the resolution necessary for understanding the human component. What were people's lives like? What were everyday interactions with the environment that the graphs do not tell us about? The examples I gave previously of successful environmental studies of human behavior have a couple of things in common. Either they reveal systems of management, so patterns of change emerge from the environmental data because they are repetitive or regular, 
or they combine a range of data sources, often from other disciplines, to explain the observed changes in vegetation. Um, so this is my first appeal to the world of environmental archaeology to um, uh, be open to other disciplines and to embrace interdisciplinarity a little bit more. Um, uh, <coughs> so my work tends to focus on um, early modern woodland management, so not the far distant past. Um, uh, <coughs> and um, uh, working on that period has made something very clear to me, um, that systems of management, um, which are becoming, I, I would say, a little bit fashionable at the moment, um, to identify past systems of wooden management. Um, uh, they were in many places and at many times unusual, <coughs> the exception rather than the rule. The overwhelming impression is of opportunistic and reactive exploitation of the wood resource, cutting timber and underwood as a response to dynamic and unpredictable personal circumstances or economic and cultural forces. Systematic planning, especially intergenerational, on the timescale of tree growth, only seems to occur in an elite institutional setting, often aristocratic or industrial, where the security of inherited land tenure permits this length of vision. Since written, written records most commonly emerge from elite institutions, their records of strictly systematic woodland management dominate the historian's view and have, I think, distorted our sense of how humans interacted with their wood resources, particularly in the civilised world. I, as I said, I rely very heavily on history as a discipline informing the environmental archaeology side of my research. Occasionally, these, these institutions butt up against what, in their worldview, are indiscretions against the established order. A stolen tree, a cattle wandering into the woods, or illicit nut picking. These court cases, fines, complaints and warnings start to illustrate through the negative space that they create, the unsystematic yet everyday and common use of woodland. Um, this is an example of the use of historical documents. This is a, something from the 1590s, um, a, a simple account of trees being felled and their value in one of the woods that I study. <coughs> so that for most of human history, the normal was, I propose, a complex mixture of unplanned irregular harvesting of wood resources particularly where wooded land was held in common, in short, messy management. <clears throat> How then do we probe these patches of noise? I propose that we take an imaginative leap and consider using narrative or storytelling to help fill in the blanks. This, however, needn't be whimsical. Narrative can be used as hypothesis. The hypothetical status of fiction, its condition of being possible, plausible, somewhere between true and false, is something intuitively understood but routinely forgotten. Um, so, so says Margaret Key. But what does this look like? What does it mean to use narrative as hypothesis? And, uh, and uh, another quote, this is from the mother of science fiction, Ursula Le Guin. She says that fiction in particular, narration in general, may be seen not as a disguise or falsification of what is given, but as an active encounter with the environment by means of posing options and alternatives, and an enlargement of present reality by connecting it to the unverifiable past and unpredictable future. The historian manipulates, arranges, and connects, and the storyteller does all that as well as intervening and inventing. Like, I would pose that um, uh, this can easily be dismissed as speculation or supposition, but what if we consider some aspects of the past as verifiable, well, actually, it says that the past is unverifiable. This is, after all, what we strive for as archaeological scientists. Stepping into the shoes of people in the past, fleshing out their world, their lived experience, trying to understand their decision-making processes, motivations, etc., can, I suggest, give new perspective on scientific data. This is where my paper is a little bit tentative, and I'm very happy to be shot down. <coughs> so if stories and narratives are presented as hypotheses, what can we pick out from them that's testable? Or to use proper terminology, falsifiable? Can they give the tools of environmental archaeology another way in? I'd like to explore the use of narrative with a couple of quick examples that have come up during my work. So this is an area of Upper Coldale in Pennines, where woodland tends to exist as a patchy mosaic of small enclosed parcels occupying the steeper ground of the valleys. As a bit of a generalization, it can be said that each established farmstead includes one piece of woodland within its boundaries, work from historic maps and ground flora distributions, 
show that this pattern of trees in the landscape was similar 200 years ago and probably 400 years ago. Pollen diagrams from the upland peaks of the area suggest some kind of change in tree cover in the late medieval period. But what has happened since then? How has the patchwork of woodland been managed and used? This is one example of the kind of woodland you get in this area. <coughs> and this is a little, little section of the story. The war years were hard on dads, so no lads to help on the farm. At hay time, him and man called boys stalling themselves. After the war, he sold the trees and backwood because he needed the brass. I can't remember who they went to. Then we planted the ones that are there now. We can empathise here with the life of the hill farmer, a hard grind at the best of times, and even more difficult when the structures of life are disturbed. In a way, I've cheated a bit here because this is part of an oral history that I conducted with someone who grew up on a farm up, up the hill um, uh, where that picture was taken in the 1930s. But it is this that got me thinking about thinking down this whole track. If I was to imagine and write about being a hill farmer, I may well come up with the possibility of woodland acting as a savings account, a one-off windfall for each generation, to be accessed in times of need as a response to death or marriage of your daughter or building a new barn. How then do we turn this imaginative speculation into hypothesis? The key features of this particular story um, uh, are felling of a significant number of trees in each small woodland parcel, which are irregular intervals. Which new avenues of investigation does, does this open up for us? So multi-stemmed oak stools, like you saw before, are common in these woods, regrown from repeated cuts over the years, and they may well give us tree ring data showing irregular felling intervals. There are also charcoal burning platforms in amongst the woods, <coughs> such as this. It's a very uh, gentle earthwork. It's the charcoal burning platform at the bottom of the, um, the wood described. <coughs> Our hypothesis would suggest that these platforms would show only low levels of production, and charcoal analysis may reveal an age profile with a long tail demonstrating the coaling of wood from large trees, uh, such as this, where you have. Um, the majority of small um, small age wood being turned to charcoal, and, uh, and then and, uh, small amounts of older wood. <coughs> in some situations, historical data could be used. The selling of trees at important life events may show up in wills and other documents. So this is the kind of thing I've been using to, to get in to understanding how these small woodlands were managed and, uh, during this period. Um, another example, which is slightly more left field, um, uh, comes from literary depictions of charcoal burners. Um, uh, <coughs> here we have a bunch of charcoal burners up in uh, North Lancashire in the early 20th century. Wordsworth described charcoal burners as vagrant dwellers in the houseless woods. And this element of mistrust and mystery follows through many literary, so literary sources and folklore um, into, for example, Russell Hoban's dystopian future of Ridley Walker. <clears throat> and to read that quote, all the trees in there and charcoal burners and amongst them working their hearts. You could see one of them in there with his red jumper, what they always wear, making charcoal from the, for the iron ready at Withers Dump. So in this story, charcoal burners represent bad luck and are shunned not only because of their itinerant lifestyle, but also because it's perceived that the knowledge of charcoal production was gained only through a dark path a transgression of these people's humanity. Um, uh, here we have a fascinating social relation, which, as I say, appears in many literary sources, involving a natural resource, involving natural resource use and the power structures of industrial production. Um, uh, but how do we tie this back to good old safe archaeology? How do we test a hypothesis that charcoal burners were shunned by the wider populace? One way might be to ask if they formed a distinct social group if they lived apart. To do this, we can look at the archaeology associated with charcoal production. In North Lancashire and Cumbria, a standard feature of the woods is the charcoal burner's hut, where itinerant workers would dwell whilst they made charcoal. <coughs> this is a simple construction of wood, stone and turf, which was their temporary dwelling. The remains of these huts are clear and accompany most collections of charcoal production platforms. Was this then an itinerant population? Do they conform to the narrative of being a, a separate community? In West Yorkshire, by contrast, which is my study area, the remains of charcoal burners huts are never seen. 
there is no archaeology for vagrant dwellers in the houseless woods. Historical records and censuses contain no mention of the occupation of charcoal burner, but clearly charcoal was made. Were the producers of charcoal in this area also farmers and labourers, part of the community who undertook a little bit of extra seasonal work, and therefore less of the community apart? <clears throat> in a way, much of this is not new. How does this approach differ from the act of interpretation, something that all archaeologists do? Both involve the imagination and hypothesis formation. I would argue that storytelling goes a step further. It allows the researcher to embrace empathy, to put themselves in someone else's shoes, to see through their eyes, and to place the human as historical agent in the centre of their story. This can be powerful. With power, however, comes responsibility. As Taylor and Marchant say, the course resolution of paleoecological data has meant that interpretations often appear to be able to accommodate or to refute whatever theory is commonly accepted at the time. And avoiding this misuse of narrative will involve very clear statements of what is storytelling and what is fact. The risk of getting carried away with, with this aspect of um, uh, communication, um, of losing sight of scientists' claim to a certain kind of truth, is mitigated by holding narrative as hypothesis, as testable, as a starting point for discourse and experiment experimentation, which can lead us to new knowledge. To, con to conclude, narrative allows the human actor to become visible and to become the agent of change or interaction with their environment, rather than the star role of the narrative being an abstract concept, such as the state or market forces or custom or climate. This is, I think, necessary if we are to understand at all the non-systematic, opportunistic, messy, mundane, and vitally important everyday interactions of people with 